Yeah. Uh, as this is a, a one-hour session, it's a flash session, which is a slightly different format than, than the workshops. Uh, we will we will start because the uh, the period is, uh, is 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 limited. Uh, as I've said already, do not hesitate to come and sit around the table. This is not a workshop with panelists. It's a it's an update on the uh, on the project, and the goal is to present, particularly to people who are not necessarily familiar uh, with the project. Some around this table are, but. Um, what it is, what is the intention, and what is the, the current stage of the, of the discussion. <clears throat> so my name is Bertrand Lachapelle. I'm the director of the uh, Internet and Jurisdiction uh, Project. Paul Fellinger here with me is the, is the manager. And you have on, on the table a brochure that we have distributed in a significant number of the bags, but we didn't expect that there were so many people attending. So uh, you may not have hit have had it in your bag. Um, I want to, to launch this presentation and open uh, the floor for, for questions and discussions uh, uh, afterwards. So without further ado, um, the, first, the first element that I want to highlight is that it is a status update. This is something that we will want to, to do at every uh, IGF. We have had IGF uh, workshops every year since uh, 2012. Uh, we will have another one um, this week on Thursday uh, uh, in the afternoon under the theme, Will Cyberspace Fragment Along National Jurisdictions? But I would just wanted to make a statement that this is a presentation of the current status. It is not a finalized regime and framework, and it is also a basis for getting feedback and, and input on, on where it is. So, the starting point is to discuss what is the background, what, why are we here, and why do we need to do something. And one of the big challenges that I do not have to detail too much is the fact that it is extremely difficult to define and determine on the traditional geographic criteria what are the applicable laws in an environment where the services and the internet and the platforms are cross-border. And let, let us remember that there is a huge benefit in the fact that the Internet is transborder. This is why it was invented for. So we, we need to keep that in mind because we're taking it for granted. But it is actually important to preserve. The fact that the platform, the operators, the um, servers, the users, and many intermediaries are in different uh, jurisdictions is in different locations is actually bringing a set of criteria for determining potential competing uh, applicable laws. And this is particularly true in situations where we're dealing with content uh, or speech where the laws in the different countries are very different. To give you a very concrete example, uh, without going very far, um, in France and in Germany, the rules applicable to hate speech or to anti-Semitism are completely different from the rules in the United States, which means that things that are perfectly legal in the US are illegal in Europe. And if you're using a platform that is located in the US, but you're using it in Europe, the question of what is the applicable law and jurisdiction is a big um, question. And so the end result of this tension between the uh, cross-border nature of the internet and the services and the uh, fragmented nature of the legal system today is that there are tensions between the actors. They are um, not understanding each other. They are conflict of um, requirements and, and needs. And so the result of this situation is that we do not have an international framework. And there is a big distinction between the governance of the internet, of the logical layer, and um, the names, numbers, the IP addresses, and so on, and what I call, by lack of a better word, the governance on the Internet. What are the rules that apply to what people do on the Internet? The good things they do and the bad things that they can do. And so there's no overarching framework for the governance on the Internet, and the end result is that very naturally people use the tools that are available to them, and that includes a proliferation of national laws that have absolutely no guarantee of being um, 
compatible and on the one hand a sort of re-territorialization of cyberspace but also extraterritorial extension of sovereignties when people are leveraging the location of the operators in one particular country to make sure that their laws apply also extraterritorially. And so we're in a situation of legal competition, collision of laws and potential fragmentation. It's a very loaded word and we will explore it in more detail on Thursday. So I don't want to belabor here, but it is clear that we're in a situation where each individual decision may seem perfectly coherent in the short term, but the cumulative effect of all those decisions may actually destroy one of the benefits that we are um, getting from, from the Internet. <clears throat> Which leads to a situation that in the international system, the traditional modes of uh, state cooperation do not function well here. There are no international treaty, no harmonization of content rules, of course, but also the mutual legal assistance treaties that are used for criminal uh, issues are simply not functioning, they're too, too slow, and they do not cover issues that are not criminal. And there are many situations where there's new so-called dual incrimination, something is illegal in one country, but not in the other. So here the MLATs don't work. So in this context, the result is an increase in direct transborder requests from law enforcement, public authorities, governments of all sorts, to platforms, operators, DNS operators, can be CCTLD, GTLDs, but also the Google, Facebook, and, and others of this world, that are located in another country. <clears throat> and this for three things, basically. Domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. And if you think about it, if you are in a country, and I used to be the French representative in, in, in the French government for those issues, so you are concerned that something has been posted in another country that is illegal in your country, you have three reactions. One, you want the domain to be taken down, or you want the piece of content to be taken down, or and you want to have the information about who has posted this to make prosecution if the person is in your country. And so the problem is that the current mechanism of sending direct requests lacks transparency and, uh, and clear procedures. It is under the responsibility of the operators and the platforms to make decisions, but the way the requests are being sent, the way they are formulated, the information that is provided about them is not really detailed. And so in that context, it seems that some framework is needed for that very specific set of issues. Transborder requests for domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. And in order to ensure the coexistence of different laws in those shared cyberspaces, we have stumbled upon the notion of procedural interfaces. So in other words, there is no harmonization on substance. But there will be and there can be harmonization of form of sort of procedures to establish in form of interoperability between the actors in the triangle between states, the platform and operators, and the, and the users. And the main objective and the main background uh, criteria is to ensure due process, transparency, and also predictability in the decision making. And I'll come back to that um, afterwards. So. What is, the, what is the project itself? It was launched in 2012, uh, the beginning of 2012. There was Paris-based secretariat in France. It is a neutral facilitation platform to discuss this and the development of a framework. And it has an observatory that now contains uh, 33 um, international experts in institutions uh, that include uh, Oxford, Harvard, and many other international uh, places. I see some in this, in this room. Um, and a dialogue process. So the, the purpose of the observatory is keep track of trends and produce a monthly newsletter with cases. Uh, and Paul, if you can show the uh, two retrospect thing. Uh, we've published and you can have them online if you use this little card uh, with the addresses. We have produced for 2012 and 2013 a compilation of the cases that have been selected. There are 20 a month in the newsletter. There are 600 subscribers for the plus 
for the newsletter. And this is the compilation of the more than 800 cases uh, for the, 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 two, the two years. But the project is also, and probably most importantly, the, uh, the observatory is there to, to support and provide evidence for this discussion. It's a multi-stakeholder dialogue process. And the goal is to get people around the table to do something that is, I think, too rarely done. Usually people have a problem with each other. They are grumbling that this actor doesn't do that, or I made a request it didn't go through, or you are adopting a law that is not working. The goal of a multi-stakeholder process, whatever it is, be it workshop here or any ongoing discussion, is to turn problems that people have with each other into a formulation that is the problem they have in common. And the problem that people have in common is how do you find a framework and rules to organize the interaction between those actors that respect human rights and the concerns of the different uh, legal authorities. So to do this, uh, we have organized, as you can see here, um, a discussion process with more than 70 uh, entities. Not all have participated to the same level. There's a, probably a core, more committed group of 30 uh, actors. But overall, public authorities from the different countries that you can see, institutions, um, the technical community, civil society. And so we had, in particular, made an emphasis to um, involve uh, countries such as India and Brazil, who are very important players in this, uh, in this respect, not only by the number of people, but also by the approach that they're taking on those issues and the problems they might be facing. Uh, likewise, in civil society, uh, the technical community uh, is also involved. So you can, you can see the list um, here. That meant 15 meetings in uh, 10 countries, and we participated in outreach events in more than 20 countries uh, as well in the last two, two years. And the outcome of this uh, process, <clears throat> or the objective, is to develop what can be described as a, <clears throat> sorry, an operational, and I insist on the term operational. This is not a, a, a think tank exercise or an academic exercise, however, uh, much respect that, that there is for, for that. It is an operational effort based and co in cooperation with academic um, uh, research. And a multi-stakeholder due process framework for the submission and handling of direct transnational requests for domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data on issues that are mostly related to user-generated content or harmful behavior like phishing, malware, and so on. And this objective is actually um, achieved in the following way. The first two years and all the meetings that I mentioned have led to the identification of six building blocks for a potential framework. And in these six building blocks, they can be distributed in two columns, basically. The first column is dedicated to how requests are being made. And this includes questions of authentication. I receive, for instance, at a platform, an email from somebody who says, I'm the law enforcement agency in Kenya. And the address is a Yahoo Mail account. How do I know that this person, and this is a, an actual fact, uh, also because access in many of those countries have huge constraints, and, and so they are using a, a normal email to send that kind of request. How do you authenticate this? The second thing is, what is the request format? What should it contain? Today, you have anything from a flimsy sheet of paper to a very structured document with all the information. How do you establish transparency reporting? Today, each platform is doing its transparency reporting, but there is no interoperability or standard for the, for the information. So traceability is extremely important. So that's. I will probably reuse the expression. It's a bit of plumbing. You know? It's uh, how do you format the request, how do you send them, and so on. The most delicate issue is, of course, the other part, like how they are handled when they arrive at the, um, at the companies and they are being screened and, and decided. 
And here there are questions of who makes the determination? What is the respective role of courts, platforms, operators, and, and other actors? Uh, what are the criteria? Uh, what are the procedures? In particular, if we care about due process, notification of users and contradictory procedure is a very important element. And finally, uh, not to mention appeals, of course. And finally, when you implement the decision, whatever, whatever it is, um, what are the technical constraints that you should respect to not harm the infrastructure, and what are the um, dispute management mechanisms? I'll come in more detail now. So basically, at the end of 2013, there was a general agreement among the participants of this uh, process, and again, it involved the, the different actors I mentioned, including the Google, Facebook, um, Yahoo, and, 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 and others, but also the governments in different countries on the existence of the six building blocks. And the discussions since then, in 2014, have led to basically uh, a, a deepening of the understanding and the following components that you will see described uh, when you pick up the, um, the brochure that is on your table uh, that, you can, that you can take away and, and, and see afterwards. But I will um, describe them now keeping the two dimensions that uh, I alluded to before, request submission and request handling. On the request submission, the framework that is emerging is based on two elements, a common request format and mutualized databases. So the common request format is very simple. If you think about an analogy, when you create an HTML page, there are markup tags that say this is the title, this is in bold, this is in this, this is in that. And the benefit of this is that you can have different readers and different um, uh, produ production tools. Once it is being sent, it is compatible because it's interoperable. People share the same set of markup tags. Think of it in the same way for the request. Whatever the uh, sender of the request may use as a software to prepare the request, whatever they may uh, use on the other side, the idea is to have a set of markup tags that not only allow to structure the request, but also to highlight what is necessary in the request. And this includes um, the notion of points of contact in the requester and the requestee. And that means that, for instance, in one country, the law enforcement agency or the courts and so on would have one gatekeeper of sorts that actually validates the authenticity of the, uh, of the request. Not necessarily the content, but the fact that it does come from an, uh, an appropriate um, issuer. Uh, the second thing is the request needs to contain the type of request, that it is a domain seizure, it's a content takedown, it's an access, um, access to user data. But it is also to include in a certain way the rationale to say it's a content takedown, but it is for reasons of hate speech or for reasons of defamation or other types of keywords, so that there can be traceability and statistical analysis. That is extremely important. As a human rights principle, and as a due process principle, any restriction of an individual freedom should be based on law. That means that any request that is being sent needs to be able to make a reference to the actual uh, actionable law in that specific country and the procedure that should be followed. Like, For instance, is it an article of the Constitution that is relevant? Is it a particular law regarding internet? Or are there particular laws regarding um, the press that are transposed for internet matters? But also on those issues and that type of requests, does the national procedure require a warrant or a court decision or not? <clears throat> So it may seem mundane, but a sort of compulsory presence of that sort of information in a request is something that raises the bar of due process from what it is today. Today you get requests and the national basis is not necessarily known. Finally, uh, elements regarding uh, request details, the specific action and the, um, the specific fact, the user ID, the uh, video ID, the picture ID, etc., so that it's as granular as possible. 
and whether the action is, for instance, uh, content takedown permanently f anywhere or uh, geolocalized content inaccessibility for a limited period. So documenting this type of request is extremely important because it facilitates the decision making on the other side. But that is extremely important as well. Any request should contain a justification for necessity, proportionality, potentially urgency, and very importantly, confidentiality. Why is it important? The fact that the regime is focusing mainly on issues related to speech uh, and uh, content related allows to establish notification of the user as a default, which is not the case always. It's a fundamental element that allows defense. And the fact that you have notification of the user by default requires that there can be exceptions that will require confidentiality. So this is why in the markup tags, there is an evaluation, uh, a placeholder for any comment saying, for the following reason, this particular request should not be notified to the user. You may be aware, I don't get into details, but you may be aware that there are discussions going on at the moment on cases in the US regarding whether non-notification of the user can even be forever. Because there are situations where there's a gag order that says you cannot tell the user that there has been some uh, thing about him, and this should last forever. And there is a discussion not decided yet that whether this is constitutional and whether there should be limited period. But anyway, having conditions for confidentiality is important. The interesting thing is that once we have a request format of that sort, it can be coupled to four specific types of neutralized databases that constitute the plumbing of the system. The first one is the points of contact that I mentioned are listed in registries to facilitate authentication. And the discussions that are going on point to a possible uh, role of entities like Interpol, Europol, or other police corporations in maintaining the registries in question. That would not be exclusive, but it's one of the options. Likewise, on the other side, the different platforms and operators will, of course, maintain a registry of their point of entry, which is if you have a request to send, please send it to this address which can in different cases be subdivided. It can be a specific address for requests from one region or a specific address for a request of a certain type, etc. That will be up to the actors. Think of it in terms of analogy as the port that is uh, used in, uh, in networking. Like there's a specific port for that type of request and they can be subdivided. The second category or the second database is related to traceability. <clears throat> you may have noted that in the uh, request format, there is information regarding who is sending it, or actually I didn't mention it in that slide, but there is information about who is sending it and where it is going to, the type of request, the rationale. Those elements are not detailed enough to be related to a specific request, but there are statistical elements. And the idea is that the system would capture those neutral statistical metadata the moment the, 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 the request is being sent to feed a mutualized database of traceability that would function in open data. So that will, will allow, provided that the standards is, is shared, a diversity of entities to mine this data to produce different types of transparency reports. One would want, for instance, to track whether defamatory defamation requests are growing around the world. Another one will want to see how many requests have been sent on uh, video issues between one country and one particular platform, for instance. And so the idea is that there is a benefit in neutralizing this information and in particular, in making sure that it is collected as automatically as possible. The third element is extremely important, and it's connected to what I was mentioning earlier regarding 
the explicit mention of the legal basis for requests. As you know, every single large company is maintaining in-house a database of known laws, quote unquote. And this database of known laws is a huge endeavor. As anybody who is trying to do anything of that sort, it's 190 countries, the laws are changing constantly, there is jurisprudence, there is the constitutional layer, there are international treaties. It's a huge task. <clears throat> and not only is it a huge task for each large company and a duplication, because each of them is doing it again, but it is completely inaccessible for the smaller companies, and especially if you're a startup, you're launching your activity, it is accessible worldwide, and there is no way you will have a legal and human resources to set up that kind of database. So it makes perfect sense for just that reason to have a mutualized database of legal references related to those types of requests. But there's another reason why it makes sense is that it is a huge endeavor, so if you want to be exhaustive from the onset, you're thinking about big numbers and big costs. The fact that it is coupled to the, the, to the, um, to the request allows potentially to build the database from the bottom up, each request at a time, like a bit like pheromones are leaving a trail. So every time there's a request coming in, the part that is related to what is the relevant uh, law and procedure feeds into the database. So that's a benefit. But there's a danger with that, because how do you ensure that it is exhaustive, that it is accurate, that all the dimensions are taken into account? This is why this legal reference database needs not only to be mutualized, but also to be editable in a certain way by third-party actors, so that law firms, uh, scholars, um, individual companies, and any other type of initiative can, in an appropriate manner, enhance the database, make it more complete, validate that some... Uh, I don't want to, to, to go as far as a Wikipedia type of thing, but there is a community around this database that needs to be built in order to make sure that it is as exhaustive and accurate as possible. And last but not least, a log database is um, necessary to keep at least the trace of the request ID number, the timestamp, and where it came from and where it, where it went. At minimum, having one log database that says the requests that went through the system are identified. A question may be interesting to explore, but it has delicate consequences, is whether more information should be in this database, including the actual content of the request, to enable reviews or picking one uh, request to see how it worked. But the moment you put more information in the database, a log database, the question of access becomes a big question. So there's a, a balance here that will be discussed in the, coming, in the coming months. So that is the plumbing part, a request format and mutualized database to ensure transparency, legal references, and so on. Now, if I move to the second leg, how requests are being handled is the tricky element because the goal is to develop shared procedure norms and dispute mechanisms. And here, the goal is to have more predictable decision making and to establish or to explore dispute management uh, mechanisms. The current decision making in those issues is relatively simple. It is reception of the request by, by the platform or operator, checking whether it is receivable, it is complete and, and, or not. Then the platform makes a determination with or without the loop of notification of the user, because there are cases where they do, the cases they don't. There's a decision, which is yes, we accept the request, no, we refuse it, or we propose a change. Change typically is a uh, request is being made for global takedown, and the response is no global takedown, but a GOIP filtered uh, non-accessibility for a certain period, for instance. But then it goes to implementation. And it is an, a very heavy burden for the, for the platforms that they have to, to do. 
and they have a lot of internal procedures, but they are relatively um, closed and opaque, and the criteria are not always extremely clear. Most of the time, it's on the basis of the uh, terms of service. And those of you who have made the effort may have seen that in the last few years, the terms of service have developed very significantly in terms of the level of detail and the, in an attempt, precisely, to provide more clear understanding of what are the criteria that are going to be applied. So the idea is how to make this even a bit more predictable and a bit more manageable to the benefit of everybody. The first thing is adding a user notification loop by default, as I mentioned earlier, with potential exceptions, but justified. The notion is there should be a loop in, in that regard. The second element is <clears throat> Although there is no way there will be harmonization on substance, as I said before, it is perfectly possible, as seems to be the case, to develop shared procedural norms, standards, and criteria. In particular, it is obvious that the territorial criteria cannot be absolute black and white where Oh, okay, it's simple. The territorial criteria says it should be the law of this country or that country. In many cases, there is a set of criteria that actually pull in different directions. And taking into account the different criteria that justify application of one law or another is one of the difficult tasks that the, the platforms are doing today. So the discussion that we're facilitating is actually aiming at producing an agreed set of criteria that the platforms, but also the users and the governments can understand will be the basis upon which the decisions are going to be made. And finally, because there is a set of criteria in most cases, and they might be pulling in different directions, the idea that has emerged is, what about a panel or panels in the plural that could provide advice for companies who are caught in a situation where they feel that the criteria are not going in a clear direction. The advice would be non-binding, the composition of the panels or panel is still a discussion to have, but this is something that has emerged as a potential facilitation and a potential improvement. So that's the first leg, and if you look at the brochure, it's the first column in the second uh, block. The most delicate situation is you can do the plumbing as much as you want. You can improve the circulation, the transparency, the whatever. There still are situations where people don't agree. <laughs> One country has requested something, and the platform says, well, we're sorry, but no, for the following reason. So the first element is that when the answer is not documented or when it is not even coming, because there are situations where there is even not an answer to the question, it is frustrating for the parties and it is increasing tensions uh, between the, the actors and the government in particular. But even when there is a documented response, <clears throat> the situation can create and maintain tensions. And there are no channels of interaction today that are pre-established to alleviate the tension between the platforms in one country and the governments in another country when there are public order issues or a real discrepancy between the different national laws. And so, because there is a risk of escalation, there is a request that is being made, the content is really triggering some kind of problems locally, then the platform is being blocked, then there is a recourse in the courts, and this goes on and on and on, and at one point it triggers the adoption of a new law in the country that is actually fragmenting, etc., etc. So, when there is no channel of interaction, this is what happens. So, the idea is, can there be additional transnational mechanisms that can safeguard the user's right and diffuse tensions. And that includes procedural appeals on the basis of the shared norms and standards that, that we mentioned before, but also something new, which is a predetermined facilitation mechanism 
if you think about it, there's no way we can have an arbitration uh, system really between a government on the one hand and a platform on the other side. I mean, this is not the way it is going to work, at least in the foreseeable future. But at the same time, having something where a facilitator that would be accepted by both parties, that would be pre-agreed in, in terms of procedures, would basically bring the parties together. It can be just oral, it can be a teleconference, it can be a very urgent matter if there is a problem. To basically say, listen, we're in a situation where the criteria are not clear. The evaluation of the actual danger locally or the actual infringement is not so obvious. Can we try to find on a case-by-case -case basis the best I wouldn't say balance, but the best respect of rights of the different sort and security issues and legal aspects and so on. And the facilitator may achieve the result, like the parties do agree on a solution, and here it's fine. But if the parties don't agree, the idea is that the facilitator can provide a so-called best advice, like situation is difficult, but my best advice is do this. And here there are conditions, or there should be conditions, under which the operator follows the best advice or not, and if not, how it provides enough justifications on the reasons why it is not being followed. So this is, in a nutshell, the introduction of a sort of architecture to diffuse tensions, to facilitate dialogue, Facilitate dialogue to develop the framework, as we've done in the last two years, and it will continue necessarily to update this framework. And also facilitating dialogue to diffuse tensions in situations where there is no clear answer in international law on which law should prevail or which decision is the optimal. So, once again, this would, um, sorry, um, request format, common request format, um, mutualized databases, improved workflow with shared procedures and, and norms and criteria, and dispute management. So we're getting to the end. The work plan in 2014-15 is relatively simple. Uh, generally speaking, it's refining this, this framework and putting it to implementation. So getting to technical specifications, because we now have reached a level of uh, clarity, I think, on the two elements of databases and, and request format that allow to move to the technical specification of the plumbing of the system. Second, documenting and formalizing the emerging procedural um, norms and, and standards. To give you a very concrete example, both in Turkey and in Pakistan, the courts have made a decision that blocking an entire platform because of one piece of content is not proportionate. This is an emerging norm that will be documented because it emerges and it appears in other court decisions. And there are a few other issues regarding conditions under which access to user data should be granted, uh, conditions under which uh, a domain name should be taken down. In particular, there's a growing recognition that domain seizures, per se, are not a content control tool and that they should be dedicated mostly to situations where there is phishing, uh, malware, where the site itself is actually harming the infrastructure, or the rare cases where the content, the whole activity of the site is dedicated to a content that is sufficiently broadly illegal. So these kinds of norms is the second element, how to document them and, and make the, um, the list of, of criteria. <clears throat> and finally, refining or defining the dispute management procedures. Um, it is clear that the next bullet point is an essential element because uh, these things require organizing meetings, uh, traveling, and, 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 and facilitating also the participation of a certain number of actors. So increasing the resources and the capac human capacity of the, of the project is, is important. Uh, and I take the opportunity to make an open call for anyone who has the capacity to help us uh, identify additional funders. It's uh, welcome. Uh, preparing the pilot implementation. And uh, fundamentally, I finish with just a list of a few questions that 
we are now uh, addressing or confronted with, and I will open the, uh, the floor, but you can see some of these, like, if there are mutualized databases, what are the respective benefits of having a structure that would manage them centrally and have uh, economies of scale? Or is it better to distribute this responsibility with a set of actors so that there's a sort of cluster of people who become um, interested in making sure that these databases are correctly maintained? Um, how to assure the accuracy of the legal reference database? How to compose potential advisory panels? Uh, what is the procedure for dispute management? These are the concrete uh, things and of course case studies and examples and best practices from various uh, systems will be, will be integrated. So that's basically it for the, uh, for the presentation. I hope that it provided a, a glimpse or a better understanding of what the project, the initiative, the framework is and where we are in the discussion. Um, you can get more information on the site at internetjurisdiction.net where you can subscribe to the newsletter uh, every, uh, every month. Uh, the Twitter account is, is here and this is our address if you want to contact and, and, and talk to us. So with that, um, I think it's time to, uh, to open the floor uh, if you have any questions or comments or any contribution to, to make on those, on those topics. Who is starting first? Yeah. Hi, my name is Alon Byrne. I'm with the Ranking Digital Rights Project. With the? Ranking Digital Rights. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question with regards to the dispute management procedures that you've explained or the advice and possibilities in which they could go. It seems that the dispute management procedures are strictly focused on the interaction between government and companies. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So my question is, how does the user get involved in this? Mm -hmm. So there is, you've introduced the possibility of, or the obligation to some extent of having a user notification, but what is the user's right to remedy and how is it possible to perhaps introduce it somehow in this procedural framework? Thank you. Two, two elements to your question. It's a very important question. One element is whether the users individually can initiate something at the very beginning and make requests themselves. For the moment, this is not what has been uh, the focus. We understand that there is a question about this. The first focus is the request that currently the platforms and operators are receiving from the different um, uh, law enforcement and, and entities. That being said, interestingly enough, there is a very clear case now in a different space of user requests with the right to be forgotten discussion in the European uh, Union, the European Court of Justice. And we are actually having discussions with some of the people who handle those, those issues uh, in the different platforms and at Google because it is raising exactly the symmetric question of how do you handle the number of requests and what is the procedure for the number of requests. And it will probably have um, uh, ring a bell when we talk about advisory panels and things like that, we have developed that in the last year and, and, and so. And it was interesting to see that on the right to be forgotten, Google had established relatively rapidly an advisory panel which will not deal with the individual cases, but that will provide a sort of framework uh, of that sort. So there are similarities, but in our case, we're dealing with requests coming from mostly public authorities. There's a second leg to your question, which is in the appeal mechanisms and in the um, dispute management, I may have orally emphasized too much the, uh, the dimension of the relationship between the government and the platforms. You're raising a very valid question. On the appeal process, uh, the procedural appeal, it seems relatively obvious that there should be an avenue for individual users to say, for instance, the norms or the criteria have not been applied correctly. That's, that's clear. On the dispute management, it is a very delicate issue. It's not sorted out completely. Here again, the focus has been more on the direct relationship between the government and the, um, and the platform. But a very interesting case question is, in some cases, 
is there a possibility that the facilitation tool involves, if not the user himself, but a representative of the user? Is there, for instance, a sort of tripartite discussion? In which cases could there be a tripartite discussion or a bipartite? This is the type of questions that are under, uh, under discussion uh, at the moment, or that will have to be discussed. But it's a very, very important question. Where does the user fit in here? And to be frank, one element that I didn't mention, but that has to be highlighted, is the capacity to be represented is an extremely important element, because in some countries, the very fact that you have to respond is revealing who you are. And so this is something that has to be taken into account. Any other uh, comment or, or, or question? Thank you. Pierre Lenis from uh, AFNIC, .fr, and some uh, others, GTLD. Um, you talked about the uh, confidentiality and, and the fact that in some cases uh, uh, the, um, the user should not be contacted. I understand that he should not be contacted because uh, um, this is important that he stays anonymous uh, in front of the government agency or something like that because I, I don't see why a user shouldn't be contacted except if it's just to, to, to respect his anonymity. And if it is the case, uh, maybe there is a feature, another feature for this platform uh, that is very simple and that a lot of registries are currently doing. It's contact the user on behalf mm -hmm. of the law enforcement mm -hmm. agency mm -hmm. uh, or of the IP lawyers or mm -hmm. any... Uh, anything like that, to protect his identity, but inform him that there Absolutely. is something that is yeah. happening. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, thanks for forcing the clarification. This is exactly the way it is supposed to function. The contact the user loop, by definition, is through the platform, because in most cases, the information is not available to the requester. And in some cases, the requester is precisely requesting to get this information. So. It is indeed the second, in the second element you mentioned. It is the operator that is in contact with the user and is um, uh, connecting. On your first question, it's probably a little bit more complex because it's not about protecting the, uh, the anonymity. There are, there are situations where, although it is speech-related for whatever reason, there are elements of, um, of criminal investigation. There can be cases where it is criminal and there are elements, and it has to be exceptions, I fully, uh, I fully agree, but there are elements where revealing that something is underway is potentially changing evidence or changing the situation. So these are the, case, the questions, and for instance, one of the, the actors we were interacting with in checking this thing raise the point that is not incorporated yet in the slides, but that is an important element of the framework, is who has the custody of the evidence? There's an element, for instance, for those of you who are familiar with the UDRP, the Universal Dispute Resolution Procedure for, for um, uh, domain names, is that it was re revealed recently that apparently WIPO, the moment they receive a UDRP request, takes a snapshot of the website under this domain name to produce as evidence to the panels of the UDRP that are being put in place. And a lot of people have raised concern about that because, first of all, what is visible in one country, what is visible in another country can be completely different. How do you make sure that uh, the evidence has not been spoofed in one way or the other to, to present it in a way that is not what was accurately on the site, et cetera, et cetera. So in cases like this one, the ones we address, what is on the site, what is being posted, and so on, there is an element of the chain of evidence that has to be taken into account, and it's part of the due process mechanisms to also integrate those, those things. But so to answer to your question, the exceptions are situations where, and it has to be documented, I hope, the communication of the fact that there's something going on is likely to be harmful to the, uh, to the process. 
And, and by the way, uh, I take the opportunity because um, AFNIC is one of the uh, participants and supporters of the project, so I take the opportunity to thank them publicly. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Bill Woodcock, PCH. Um, when you talk about authentication, uh, when you talk about authentication mechanisms for the parties to this mm -hmm. platform, are you envisioning this as being primarily uh, implemented technologically using cryptography, for instance, or bureaucratically using human implemented processes? Well, it's a combination of both. And this is why I was talking about we're getting into the stage of the technical specification for that. Uh, the human part, in a certain way, is the identification of the point of contact. It's the fact that there is, um, at least in the first instance, it can be detailed more precisely afterwards. But fundamentally, the idea is, um, <clears throat> to take my previous example, if there is one person in Kenya, one authority in Kenya, that basically says, at least in the pilot implementation and in the beginning of the, of the system, all the requests that will be sent to this, through this format will go through this person to say, yes, it is somebody at the right, uh, because there's the hierarchical authority also that plays a, a role. It's not only is it a legitimate law enforcement entity, is it also a legitimate law enforcement entity in terms of what they have the right to do in that kind of procedure, hence the connection to the national <laughs> legal system. But this gatekeeper has basically the responsibility of saying, because I identify technically in the system as the sender, say this is coming from a, an, um, an authorized uh, law enforcement entity in my country, it is the validation and the authentication. To make a comparison, for instance, with the, the work that is going on in, um, in ICANN, on the EWG regarding the uh, directory services for the uh, reform of WUIS, they are confronted with a slightly different problem because here there is a database that has actual substance and what is at stake is not only authenticating but managing the rights of access to different pieces of this information. In the case of this regime, we do not have to manage rights of access. It's purely this is indeed Mr. So-and-so or the entity so-and-so in the country that is sending the request. So it's basically embedding in the technical layer uh, a trust network that is recognized. And, of course, there has to be uh, accreditation um, mechanism. But if I may belabor just one minute on this, there was one important question at first, which was, is this going to be a closed regime with high bar of authentication, of um, accreditation and acceptance, like uh, only some countries would be allowed to take part in the system uh, with obligation of having ratified 20 treaties on this and that. It rapidly appeared that it was very difficult to implement, first of all, because where do you put the bar? And second, who has the authority uh, to basically say yes, you, yes, no, uh, you no. Know. And so the solution that has been adopted is to put the bar in the request format and to make sure that the information that is provided, that the uh, documentation of necessity, proportionality, and so on, is de facto raising it to a level that is as high as possible so that, after all, even countries that have a very bad legal system and so on, they may have a real concern sometimes. I mean, let's be, let's be frank. And vice versa, there are countries with very good systems that may abuse it, but never mind. Uh, so here, the notion is the request format is basically the bar. And even if an actor that doesn't have all the credentials elsewhere, if it is a valid request that is properly documented, it can be, it can be addressed. Malcolm. No, thank you, Bertrand. Um, my name is Malcolm Hutty. I'm from the London Internet Exchange, and I'm also the chair of EuroISPA's uh, Intermediary Liability Committee, um, which represents internet services providers, um, access and hosting products across Europe. Um, since I last engaged with this at the workshop in Paris, 
things seem to have developed a little, so as to maybe, um, I'm getting the impression that you've rather de-scoped, that you've rather de-scoped um, your ambition somewhat um, in two ways. Um, firstly, the discussion today, the explanations today, have been very much focused on um, transnational platforms of, and you've focused on the engagement that you've had um, with the major or, or some of the major um, transnational platform operators, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo. Whereas when this project started, um, I understood that it was a more, it was, its ambition was to be to develop a process that would be applicable and useful um, beyond not just to that segment of the market, but indeed to, um, uh, to other operators, um, potentially much smaller operators, and not necessarily in that providing those type, the types of services that they offer. And certainly the um, types of actions that are being requested speak to things that go beyond the services that those operators offer. Um, you mentioned domain seizures, for example. Um, and certainly when it comes to you know, the law enforcement request to suppress content on the grounds that it is illegal, um, you're not really going to be satisfied with just getting it off Facebook. No. Yeah. Um, the aim there is to get it off the internet. And so then you need to look to see whether the process that we're developing um, is, really meets the standard that you set for yourself as being a transnational due process that it could be useful and applicable to the range of service operators um, that are out there um, in so, so that it can meet the law enforcement need of actually not just getting it off Facebook, but getting it off the internet. And looking at where this is, how this is developing, the other area where I see that you appear to be descoping is actually in the due process element. Yeah. There is a very developed focus on the request submission end, which I'm afraid looks rather like that's the easy bit. The, there, there was in our workshop in Paris really a consensus that the core of this was around the decision-making process, the adjudication process. As an operator, um, we have a request coming in saying that this material is unlawful, please will you remove it? And you have a customer who is paying you or otherwise providing value to you um, for having it there and you need to decide whether or not to do that. Now if the um, thing is unlawful under the law in which you're, uh, uh, under the um, law of the country in which you're established and the person making the request is a, is a law enforcement authority from the uh, country in which you're established and there are procedures for doing that, then all of that is simple. But once you get into the place where you've chosen to operate, the transnational space, um, then that becomes much more difficult. And what we are looking for is things to support how would we answer that question. Now, the request submission end of it, these are all things that enable a um, transnational due process to be capable of happening, but they are not, and establishing that and establishing that to everyone satisfactorily, in no way amounts to a due process element. Um, in uh, many cases where, um, you know, where you are looking to um, suppress material or to um, suppress somebody's... Um, um, expression or to um, otherwise engage with their, um, do things that would engage with their fundamental rights. Um, you have essentially um, a, a requirement to, um, if you are saying you're doing a due process, um, to actually see how these, um, the balance of rights mm -hmm. um, should be, uh, should result in an outcome in the given case. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes one way, sometimes the other. Now, um, to be honest, a lot of this isn't, you know, you're, you're, rather looks like you've put that to one side and focused on the mechanical or the administrative process of executing the request. Um, but um, certainly in, the, in the, what you said a moment ago um, about whether or not um, a user would have a right um, to be represented or indeed to, exp to ask themselves, no, hold on a second, I don't agree with this request. Well, any, in a, 
um, I'm, I'm struggling for the words here, in a general sense, as in, in a universalist sense, the user must have that right if you have any sort of due process. This is the distinction between dealing with specific platform operators and dealing with the market as a whole. Nobody has a fundamental human right to um, engage in their freedom of expression on a particular platform. It's not somebody's fundamental human right to have a Facebook page. You know? The operator there has a right to say, well, I don't want this on my platform. But once you extend this across the market, so that you're not just trying to take this something off Facebook or off YouTube or whatever, but once you're trying to make sure that it's no longer on the internet, then the, um, the human rights of the person who is doing this are engaged at that point. Um, so if that's the ambition, and that is indeed the ambition of the law enforcement side, the requesting party, um, then if you are going to say that you have a due process element, you have to meet standards, um, generally accepted standards of due process. Um, not, I, mean, I know the term is one that comes from American law, and I don't mean that the exact standards that are applied in the American context need to be applied at all. But generally there are um, broadly accepted expectations of sometimes in the European side it's sometimes called natural law or so forth or, or a fair process rights or, or so forth which include things like um, the right to be heard in your defence you know, the right um, to, to challenge the right to an ind um, independent decision maker now we don't have a right to an independent decision maker vis-a-vis -vis YouTube you know? YouTube have a right to decide what they have on their platform but if you're going to apply this generally for the purpose of ensuring that this is a mechanism for law enforcement to ensure that their laws are applied across borders uh, uh, with regards to the internet generally. And if you're going to say that you're going to have a due process mechanism, then you start to n need to look at those sorts of things. And there's, that seems to be so far undeveloped. Well, thank, thank you for two, for two reasons. The first, the first one is you're absolutely right on the uh, apparently limited scope that I've presented today and I want to highlight that this is not limited to the kind of platforms that I was mentioning particularly because for instance uh, a significant number of um, DNS operators and TLDs are part of this um, uh, exercise as you know and one of the elements is as I mentioned in the presentation to make sure that the norms and criteria that apply to the um, domain seizures requests are along the lines that I was mentioning. So basically there are different types of requests and different uh, rules that apply to, on the platforms that host content, on the domain uh, operators, on the ISP and the mobile operators in particular, uh, but also on the IP registries. For instance, the IP registries have a desire to make sure, and I think it is valuable, that the requests that may be addressed to them are basically diverted because it is not the right layer to address content issues. It harms the infrastructure, it has collateral damage and so on. And so part of the discourse is actually indeed uh, the, the range of actors that are potential interlocutors, not to say targets, of the requests so that only the appropriate type of proportionate request is being handled. And so in that regard, the first part of the system and the, and the request format may look like mundane and plumbing, but it is an element that embeds the criteria that are mentioned in the second dimension to make sure that all these different interlocutors have elements to refuse, or accept the, the request. So I confirm that the range is broader than just the companies that I, that I was mentioning. On the second, on the second element, uh, first of all, I, I think it is a great testimony to the, the value of this discussion that more and more of the business operators, including you and also the platforms in other workshops that we are organizing, are actually the ones who say we need a due process thing. 
I mean, it is sufficiently remarkable to be noted. I mean, normally, it should be a civil society group that says there's not enough due process, it's unacceptable. It is remarkable that you and, and a few others are actually going in that direction. Two elements, finally, because we're running out of time, are on, on this to answer directly. One, I reaffirm, uh, if I was not clear enough, that the notification of the user by default is a fundamental element that I think goes in the direction of embedding due process in there. The second component is as important but more delicate. The right to an independent decision maker is extremely difficult to implement today because a normal independent decision maker is a national court. And if you want a national court, which one is it, as you, as you perfectly know? If it is uh, a country that wants some content to be taken down because it's illegal in that country, there's no way it's an independent decision maker whose decision should apply worldwide. And if on the other hand we say, oh, but the ultimate decision maker is the independent court in the country where the platform is incorporated, okay, we're saying that the law of the US or China or, or Russia should apply worldwide because you just used one of their platforms. And so the challenge we're confronted with today is going in the direction of due process requires to create independent decision makers. This is where the procedural appeal can relatively be easily independent decision making because it's procedural. On the substance element, the goal is to go as close to an independent decision maker as possible without thinking, I believe, unless there is a global agreement to do that, that a sort of court could be, could be put in place that would have all the guarantees. This is exactly the challenge that you, you, you're pointing to. The desire to put in place a due process framework requires as independent decision making as possible, but the current situation is that there is no such international or transnational structure and uh, the, the, the discussion is also still underway among the different uh, actors who participate in the process. So this is why I left the list of questions in the end. You're right, the second part is much more delicate. I would say the fourth part is much more delicate. And I have absolutely no objection to what you were saying. It's exactly the challenge. How to create in due process independent decision making or as close as independent decision making as possible. And uh, there are many cases that are going to, uh, to come and, and, and we see actually this problem becoming more and more um, acute. So uh, I hope it, it answered. I think we're, um, we're at the end of this, uh, of this flash session. Uh, thank you for having come because um, it's a new format. It's a presentation about one specific project. I'm very happy that you had um, a, a, an interest. Don't hesitate to subscribe to the newsletter or more importantly, if you think that some of your activities feed into this. Uh, there was this mention of uh, ranking digital rights or the people who are doing um, databases of, uh, of legal frameworks. Don't hesitate to contact us, either Paul or me. I put the, um, the address uh, once again. Thank you very much. Enjoy the, uh, enjoy the week. Uh, there is, you will see on the, on, the, on the document here, we have the workshop on Thursday uh, with a, quite a nice list of, uh, of people on will cyberspace fragment along national jurisdictions. Uh, and for your information, there's also, and you will see that on the um, little piece of paper near the door at the entrance, there is a fragmentation track that we have coordinated with ISOC and CG. There, is a, there was a first uh, workshop this morning on technical aspects of fragmentation. There will be tomorrow, I think, uh, a, a workshop organized by CG on the more economic dimensions of fragmentation and ours on Thursday on the legal uh, aspect more of uh, fragmentation. So please come to those, uh, those meetings and thank you very much for having spent the time with us.